In the name of Jesus. God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. He is the source of all good things. And yet the world does not see him in this way. Nor at times do we. Why is it that the rich man chose this steward, this manager. Didn't he know the man's reputation? Didn't he know that he would be unfaithful? Hadn't he heard the rumors? Perhaps he had, perhaps he had not. But we must remember that the rich man in this parable of Jesus is representative of our Father in heaven. With that in mind, I think the rich man knew what was going on. For God created us in his image with divine foreknowledge of exactly what we would do. Kind of like a parent who puts in place a rule knowing that that rule at some point along the line is going to be broken by children who look at the rule and say, I want to do exactly the opposite. And yet, in spite of God knowing that we would be unfaithful, he still created us. He still placed us here as stewards, stewards of the rich gifts he gives to us. Why then was the steward unfaithful? We know the answer to that, too, don't we? As unsatisfying as it may be, it comes down to the bottom line of our corrupted nature. The man's a sinner. Sinner's going to sin. The same type of corruption that he had in the flesh, so do we. It's the same type of wastefulness as the younger son who, after receiving his inheritance, squanders it and then looks back with regret at his recklessness. The son repented. He returned to his father, knowing his father's nature. Not so much this man, though. He looks to the rich man, and he sees that there is no hope now that he's been caught. Turning over the books will mean his demise. And here we see David's words from 2 Samuel this morning. With the crooked, the Lord seems torturous. The righteous rich man will require righteous judgment. So there's no appeal, no grace, no mercy, no forgiveness. And since he's going to lose his vocation and his house, what can he do? Work? Nope. Not strong enough. Beg? No. He's proud, too proud to beg. For this would shame him. Now, hold on a minute. Why is it that begging shames this man? Not the wastefulness that he had squandered away this man's money, or really the outright theft. These things should shame him. But instead, what shames this steward, this manager, being reduced to begging. What's wrong with the conscience here? And we should pause and then consider what's wrong with our own consciences. Because we should be warned. We're just like the manager. We do pretty well going along, but it's when we face the natural consequences of our sin that we become ashamed. Like the child who's broken the lamp in the house who goes off to hide. 
Shouldn't his conscience have said, don't play baseball in the house because your parents told you not to play baseball in the house? Shouldn't that have triggered the conscience? Shouldn't that have resulted in shame and preserved him then from that sin? Well, no, it's the shame following now that he really regrets his actions. And so in this case, the man should be shamed by having broken the seventh commandment. You shall not steal. Or for that matter, any of the commandments. And yet it's being reduced to begging that shames him. What is it about us? The very corruption of our conscience. Lord, have mercy. We should see our sin as it is. That which is repugnant. That which is shameful. Just as our first parents experienced shame following their sin. We should kind of look at it like, well, the cat's puke that is sitting on the floor. Gross! But we don't. Instead, afterwards, we try to find a solution, like the rich man. So, I can't stay here, but perhaps others will receive me. Perhaps other debtors will welcome me into their homes, because the rich man won't. So he calls in the man's debtors, right? And for one, he cancels 50% of the debt. For the other, he cancels 20%. And now... They owe him. That's the way of the world, isn't it? Do something nice for somebody else and expect that they'll do nicely to you in return. Tit for tat. In the same way, then, do evil and expect evil. But wait a minute. If that's the way of the world and does seem to be the way of these other debtors, then what about the rich man? What does he do when he discovers that this fellow has gone off and used a little bit more of his money, but this time not for himself, instead for others? Shouldn't he then repay this man with more evil? But no. He commends him. Don't you think that's odd? What does he commend him for? Not for his faithfulness, not for his righteousness, but for his shrewdness. I think the rich man here reveals something about himself. That in fact, unlike what the steward thought, he is merciful and generous and faithful. Here. The steward has actually done something that's kind of right. Not just with knowing how people relate to one another, but with realizing that the rich man does intend for him to use the riches. So also our Father in heaven has given to us so generously and intends for us to use the gifts he's provided to us. The thing is, we have to look at him in the right way, by faith. Knowing exactly who he is, not the righteous judge who comes with judgment for us, but instead our divine heavenly father who comes that we should take refuge in the Son. Not treasuring up the things of this world, but instead treasuring up him. That bloody death of Christ, his resurrection on the third day, his ascension into heaven, his likeness in the darkness of this world, the darkness of our sin, his deliverance from the sins of our flesh and our enemies. He is the one who is true wisdom. He is the one who covers all our shame. He's the one who has prepared not just a dwelling place here for us, but an eternal dwelling place. And he's the one who comes to make us his friends. Now you're called to be faithful 
Not like this steward who is unfaithful. You're called to be faithful in little, but also in much. Well, what does this mean, right? What does it mean to be faithful in the little things, but also in faithful in being faithful in much? Uh, first off, I think we've got to see exactly the treasure that we have, right? From the littlest amongst us, kind of like Maud back there. She's sure cute. <laughs> to the oldest amongst us, we all have the greatest of all treasures, the full merits of Christ Jesus. And regardless of where you happen to be in life, you are rich beyond measure with an eternal reward. This is above all things to be valued and delighted in and to rejoice in. And the result of this treasure is that we we look around us and we see those who need it. And that's everybody, from the least to the greatest. Because we all have debt. Debt against one another, but also debt against God because of sin. And so we go about spreading this treasure of Christ, not canceling 20% or 50% of somebody's debt, but instead saying, yes, I actually do forgive you, and I'm not going to hold that sin any longer. It's gone, forgiven. Christ's blood has paid for it. Additionally, God has given to us little treasures too. (laughs) And that is this body and this life. A voice to sing his praises, ears to hear him speaking unto us, mouths that will receive his body and his blood this day. And these bodies are then to be used in service to one another. And that means sharing in the abundance that God has given to you. Please, don't reduce this simply to the idea of giving an offering to the church. Yes, that's absolutely important because it carries on God's good work here. But think about all the ways that you then serve your neighbor. Little things, which are big things because they make lasting memories for your grandchildren as you take them out fishing, right? What a delight to have a father or a grandfather who takes his children, grandchildren, out and gives them those experiences. Or mother goes along caring for her children, giving to them beauty each day through God's word, but also then singing with them, playing with them. Yes, God intends us to use all of these good gifts in service to our neighbors. For in the end, what advantage is there to us in keeping them to ourselves? Christ did not keep his gifts to himself, Instead, he mercifully gives himself out of love for us, knowing that he would be despised and rejected by man, but still gave his all. So to you. And some of you will simply experience that delight of others around you, right? When they receive these gifts, others face rejection. And being despised. But don't let these things stop you from giving. No. You know the nature of your Father in heaven. And he who has given to you his Holy Spirit. Gives to you that same love. That same desire to give. Selflessly. Joyously. Knowing that the giving is not what prepares for you an eternal dwelling. No. Christ has already done it and freely given it to you. The peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord.